All right, I think we're running now, part four. Um, one of the first things we're going to dive into is examining numerical data. Remember that there's a distinction between numerical and categorical data. So we're going to look at examining numerical data. And all of our analyses, all of the procedures that we use to figure stuff out about a group of numbers, a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, it's a group of numbers. And that's different from previous math that you've been doing. Although I think everybody's probably done this thing where you figure out an average, right? You take the you take some numbers and then you divide, you add them together and divide them by the number of numbers that there are. It's that kind of thing. We're going to be doing a lot of that kind of thing. And so you have to shift your brain to analyzing a group of numbers at once instead of just thinking that a variable is one number. In statistics, a variable almost always, you can think of it like a, a box that contains a bunch of similar things. So a bunch of numerical values. So you can say if x is a numerical value, a numerical variable, then x could represent anywhere from 1 to 10 billion numbers that refer to some sort of observation from some study or something like that. So we've got to start thinking about a variable representing a whole bunch of similar observations, observations of the same kind. Um, and then number two is we're going to be talking first about descriptive statistics, and that's where all you're doing is looking at a set of numbers, either a population or a sample, it kind of doesn't matter. I guess let's say population, because if you say it's a sample, then suddenly you have to think about population. Either way. But you're not interested in saying anything beyond those numbers. You're just saying, I'm interested in learning something about these observations in front of me. I'm not interested in using what I learn to say something about another set of observations somewhere else. So I'm just going to focus on this, on what's right in front of my face right here. That's descriptive statistics. Now, when we make the leap and use descriptive statistics to say something about the population that, that those observations came from, well, that's inferential, but we're not going to do that yet. So the most fundamental thing I think that we learn in descriptive statistics is measures of central tendency, or as this book call, calls it, center. Some people call them middles. Uh, some people just call them averages. Anyway, it's a measure of where the middle of your data set is. Now, you need to think of your data as stretched along a number line. As a matter of fact, it's a good practice to just draw number lines and practice putting observations on there that you see. Draw your own graphs, draw your own tables. This kind of helps you get to know your data and how it works. There are three main types of measures of center. There's the mode, which is easy to find. It's just the most common score. Now, score means numerical observation. As if, you know, 30 people in a class all took a test and you say, what's the most common test score? Oh, 73, because 12 people got a 73 exactly. The median is the half and half point. That's the point on the, on the number line at which half of the observations are higher and half of the observations are lower. So you could say, well, the most common occurring score in this class was a 73%. However, it wasn't really the, the average because the average is the median. The median was 62%. Uh, half, half of the people in the class got above a 62% and half of the people in the class, 15 people, scored below a 62%. But then there's another one that's actually the most commonly used, and that's the mean. That's what we usually mean when we say average, although some people would say all three of these are a different type of average. But they're definitely a different type of center. And the mean is when you add up all the numbers and divide them by the number that they are. You actually get a center of mass or a center of gravity that's the same. It, the core of the mean function is the same as the core of the function that determines the center of gravity of a physical object. And so a mean is actually the balance point of a number line with observations on it. I'll show you that. Anyway, so why do we care about the center? Well, we often want to represent uh, an entire data set or an entire variable all the values with a single number. We want a typical case. Now we do that in the rest of the world too, right? You say, like, I don't know if you were even around when Joe Plummer became really popular a couple of elections ago, but he was popular because he was supposed to be typical. He was supposed to be a representative that looked more like, more like a lot of Americans than a fat cat politician did. And typical, in number sense, usually means the middle. The problem is, as I've mentioned, there are lots of middles. And there's not just mean, median, and mode. There's all sorts of flavors based on the mean, median, and mode. There's especially a lot of kinds of means. But let's not worry about that for right now. 
Let's focus on this basic principle that will haunt us over and over again. The typical observation of any group, group of scores, any, any data, is a middle score. So, there you go. Nice thing to think about. So we can use a dot plot to represent these. You just put dots on a number line. So here's that 50 emails data set again. And I put a little fulcrum there or somebody else. I don't know if I made this data set or this graph. Actually, it might have been the textbook authors at the graph. So imagine that these are all on a perfectly weightless board. Well, then right here at the balance point, at the peak of the red pyramid, that's the mean. The mean is the balance point of any distribution. If you imagine that every observation was like a block that weighed the same amount as all the other observations, and each block was placed along the number line where it belongs, then you're going to see that the balance point is the mean. So the mean is one kind of a center of a distribution, and it's good because we use all the numbers to create it. That means everybody got representation. All the observations got representation there. It's like democracy. The mean is very democratic. You just add all the numbers and divide by n. Now, often when we take a mean, we're trying to figure out what the population mean is from a sample. So we did the mean of a sample, and then we say that that mean is our best guess or our best estimate of the population mean. So mu is the, the symbol for the population mean. So when we don't know the population mean, sometimes the, or frequently we say that the sample mean is our best guess as to what that is. Now when you say add the, all, the, all the numbers together, you can say capital sigma x. x means all the variables, or the variable with all the values that we're dealing with. So x is all the numbers. So that means add them all together. And then n is number of observations. So sigma x over n is the formula for the mean. Now, you notice up here on the top formula, you have a lowercase mu, which is a lowercase m. That stands for mean. And that means you're going to calculate a population mean. So you're treating your group of data as a population and not thinking that there's anything you care about beyond that. But down here, you have x bar, x with a bar over it, which is a pain to draw in Microsoft products because um, there isn't really a character for that. So x bar means the mean is just from a sample. And sometimes, as you can see, the n we make in lowercase too. There are people who get really picky with those rules, but there are different kinds of rules. I don't get too obsessed about whether it's big n or little n. So let's look at a mean example. The number of years between tornadoes for, say, four trailer parks in Arkansas or something like that. Now, often we will write any variable that we're going to analyze. We'll put the name of the variable, and if it doesn't have a special name, sometimes we'll just put x and put an underline, and then vertically in a column below that, we'll put all the numbers. So 4.6 years is trailer park 1, 7.9 is trailer park 2, and this leads to the variables in columns, cases in rows kind of thing that a data matrix is always organized as. So what's the mean here? Go ahead and calculate that if you want to participate here. There's the formula. You might want to calculate now because it might get broken down. There you go. The mean is all those numbers added together divided by 4, so 6.53. Six and a half years. Now, it's a very good idea after you do any analysis to add the units at the end. So not just 6.5, but 6.5 years. Try and remember what the units are. Now, you can stack the dots in a dot plot. So the dots are as normal. But to avoid overlapping, you just move them up. Now, this is kind of a crazy stacked up plot. But this starts to tell you something about the data set. There's a whole bunch of observations on the low end and not so many on the top. That's why the balance point is way down there, because it's like when you have the really fat kid on the teeter-totter and the really skinny kid on the teeter-totter. Well, it works if the fat kid moves really close to the center. And the skinny kid moves very far away. It's a balance. So the mean is down near the fat end of the distribution. So this leads automatically to something a little more systematic than a stacked dot plot, and that's a histogram. Hist means density, or at least that's what I understand it means in Greek, or something like density. So we can lump observations into bins. In a numerical scale, we can create um, ranges of numbers and put all the observations that, are, that fall in that range into graphically. This is a graph thing, as like one block. 
And then if there's another observation in that range, then we make another block and stack it like that. And then we use the height of every bar. So it's like a bar chart, but the, the sides touch each other to represent that it's a numerical thing and it's a histogram. And then we use the bar height to represent the number of observations per bin. So here's the email data set as a histogram. They chose to have one category from 0 to 5 characters, another one from 5 to 10. Now you have to decide if you get exactly 5, which one does it go into? So you might have like 0 to 4.99999, 5 to 9.99999, etc. You'll notice there are some categories that didn't get any because once you start, you got to follow it through. You can't make breaks in your axis. You can't ignore things. you got to put the whole thing there. you got to put all the possibilities on that axis. So you can see that there are five or maybe six of six emails that have between about 10 and 15 characters in them. And it looks like five that have between 25 and 30 because the height of that is five. So you need to learn how to read histograms. It's going to be a very important skill for this semester and for life. When we look at histograms, that's how we can figure out what shape the distribution is in. And shape, it all comes from histograms and it tells us a lot about how you can treat the data. Histograms show trends in distributions, like which values are more popular, more common. The highest bars are the most popular values. Are there more high scores than low? So does it, is it a lump that slopes off to the left or a lump that slopes off to the right? Are there a few really common scores? So a big spike in the bar. So here is uh, a data set of the ages of thousands upon thousands of people in a census. I don't actually remember where I got this from. But you can see that the average has got to be down, I don't know, late 20s, mid 20s, maybe even early 20s. Because look how many people there are in the like, 8, 10, 12, 13 range even like 15, 16. There are a lot of people in those ranges. So I made my bars really skinny. I probably shouldn't have made them so skinny, but with them being so skinny, we can see that right here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm looking at this spike right at a value of about 29. I don't know why there's so many 28 or 29 year olds this is. I'm not sure. There could be something about the way the question was asked. A whole bunch of people who are 39. Maybe it's about the nines. Who knows? Anyway, you can see that this lumps, um, but this is lumpy. A lot of the data is lumped up on the left, which means you have a lot of young people, and as the age goes up, you get fewer and fewer people in each age category. So you don't have very many old people in whatever this population is. So let's look at another distribution, old school SAT scores, back when they went from 200 to 800. So I lumped those into categories of 50 points each, so bins of 50 points each. Now again, the bars touch on their sides, and that tells you you're looking at a histogram, not a bar chart. Also, you would never make these bars different colors. That would be crazy. Um, well, not never, but almost never. And so we see the categories here, going from 150 to 200. Uh, actually, there shouldn't be anybody at 150. I think I made a simulated data set and screwed up the way I simulated it. So we have some people with scores that shouldn't be possible. But this is actually fairly normal. I mean, it's not perfectly normal. But it's lumpy in the middle, and it tapers off on the ends, and then it goes more vertical, and then it goes more horizontal in that cliff face there. So this is uh, not a bad normal distribution. It looks okay. So that last graph we saw was symmetrical. It had a lump in the middle, and it wasn't leaning to one side or another. Skew is how much it leans to one side or another. It's the lumpiness, at least left-right lumpiness of the data. It's the lean or the shift of the histogram. It's like the histogram is made out of jello and you tilted the whole plate it was standing on so it all lumps up to one side or the other. That's called skew. So when we say our data are skewed, it means um, certain categories either on the low end are more, are more popular or on the high end are more popular. So let's look at several distributions with, that have a mean of, one, of zero and a standard deviation of one. If you don't know what a standard deviation is, don't worry about it. Um, you'll learn soon enough. The point is that looking at the numbers for these distributions describing them, you wouldn't know that they were different, but they're very different. So that top one, it just has a whole bunch of negative ones and a whole bunch of ones. 
It's a crazy distribution, but we do have binary values like that from, some time, from time to time, and so they look like that. The next one is a beautiful, beautiful, perfect normal distribution. So beautiful and perfect, it must have come from simulated data, which it did. And the bottom one is an equally beautiful, perfect skewed distribution. Now, we would say that that bottom one is skewed right or skewed positive. So the direction of skew linguistically that we use is it's in the direction of the tail, not the lump. So it has a tail going off to the right, so we'd say positive skew. So is this positive, negative skewed, or symmetrical? Negative skew. Mostly negative. Positive. Negative. So we have the mean, the median, and the mode. And when you have a big numerical variable that has a lot of values in it, a lot of potential values and a lot of individual observations across those values, then sometimes the mean, the median, and the mode, you can just look at those numbers and learn about the skew. So the mode is the middle of the lump. It's the highest point. It's the most common score, so it's the highest point in a lump. The mean is always a little further toward the tail than the exact middle. Well, than the, uh, than the median is, because it's affected by extreme scores. Remember, even though you've got one skinny, skinny kid, if you have a teeter-totter 20 feet long, and that skinny kid goes sit on the end, end of it, it'll lift up the other kids on the other side of the teeter-totter. So the other kids have to move back to try and balance, or the balance point has to shift. So anyway, extreme score is either extremely low, much lower than the rest of the data, or much higher than the rest of the data, will shift the mean toward them. They will pull the mean in their direction. And the median is a half and half point. So if you imagine that your histogram is just made up of tons of blocks stacked on each other, just half the blocks on one side, half the blocks on the other. So mean median mode is the direction, is the order those things are going to come in in a negatively skewed distribution. And mode median mean is the direction for a positively skewed distribution. So here's an example. Here are some values and ages of people. We sometimes call those raw scores because we haven't done anything with them. We just And here's some R code. You don't need that if you feel like doing that in R. You can make a frequency table here. So let's look at this table. Up here under values, it's kind of hard to see the pattern necessarily. Well, it's put in order. But if we look at the values, it's counting from low, lower to higher, which is not what always happens. Um, yeah, you can kind of see the pattern just in this frequency table. F means how many times this occurs. So 31 happens one time, 27 happens two times, 26 happens three times. So the categories in a frequency table are X. Sometimes we group the categories just like for a histogram. And the frequencies is the number of observations in each category. And once you start with the categories, you've got to make it continuous across the number line until the point you stop. Don't make breaks. Don't stop doing it and then start again or anything like that. So once you have the categories, it's possible to get zero. And in fact, there were no 28-year-olds in this data set. So the mean and the median, the mean is 22.7 and the median is 22. Now, if you have access to SPSS or PSPP, you can just enter all those X values just like, well, not like you see them. You can take the raw scores and enter those in one column into a variable. And then you can use descriptive statistics from the pull down analyze menu and you can get these values too, the 20, the, the mean and the median. Now the mode is the most common score. So the way we find it is you calculate frequency for all categories and the category with the highest frequency wins. So what's the highest frequency here? Uh oh. So here's some data. Find the mode of 24 students' time to graduation. So this is the number of years 24 students took to graduate. This is actually more common at my previous university than this university. So let's see. There's two threes, so that's not it. One, two, three, four, five. It's all in order, which makes it easier. There's five of these, so that's a possibility. Is there anything that has more than five? Well, there's only three of these. There's five of these. Uh-oh. Oh, there's six of these. Thank heavens. All right. So six is the mode because there are more sixes than anything else. But look back here. There are three 26s, but there are also three 20s. Dope. There's two modes.
that can happen. You can't have two means, you can't have two medians, it's just impossible. But you're going to have a lot of modes. So let's look at these. There are the mode is in the middle, that graph that's flipping you off. Where's the mode here? About here. And here? Now the mode is the only one of these that works with categorical data. It's actually quite useful with categorical data. Because you can always just count the category with the highest frequency. So these are all different ways to see modes. By the way, this last kind of graph is called a frequency polygon. Basically, it's this graph, but you put a dot in the center of each bar and connect it with a line instead of doing the bars. Sometimes it's more useful, but they're essentially the same kind of thing. So what about this situation? Now, this is the failure of the mode. The mode isn't used very much for serious analysis because you can't predict what it's going to do. You might come back with two modes or three modes or 12 modes or no modes if everything's all even. You might um, have the mode shift around fairly radically by the addition or subtraction of a few observations. The mean and the median don't tend to do that as much, so they have better properties. I'm going to stop now and we'll move on to the next one later. Let's just look again at this basic principle. The typical observation of any group of data is the middle score. So let's look at the median and learn something a little extra about the median. The median is pretty important here. Let's talk about the quartiles. The quartiles are made in the same way the median is made. The median is just the point at which half of the data, in other words, 50% is above it and 50% is below it. Well, Q1, also called the first quartile, is a dividing point, the dividing point between the first 25% of the data and everything above that. So it's the point at which 25% of the data is below it and 75% are above it. Q2 is the median, or the second quartile. And Q3 is the third dividing point that we often talk about. It's the 75th percentile. It's the point at which 75% of the data is lower and 25% is above. You can do any kind of quantiles you want. You can do quintiles and deciles, breaking things up into 10 groups, or sometimes just percentiles. When you say, I'm in the 89th percentile, that means 89% of the data are below whatever your score was, and the other 11% are above. So, Let's look at how these things look in a graph. So we've got a dot plot, and I made colors because I was feeling fancy. It's kind of dumb to make colors, but I was using them to demonstrate, in this case, quartiles. So I jittered um, some student height. Jitter means you add a little bit of random variation so that you can, not all the dots are right on top of each other, if everybody has this, if a bunch of people have the same score. So I plotted Q1, Q2, and Q3. So Q1 is actually 60.9 inches. So in this particular data set, and it was from a, a former class I had that I taught of statistics, 60.9 um, inches, 25% of the students were below that, were shorter than that, and 75% were, were taller. 63.8 was the median, so half the students were shorter than that, half the taller. And then 66.3, 75% were shorter than that, and 25% were taller. Now, we can replace those with some values, do you see? Q2 becomes a bar, Q1 becomes a bar, and Q3 becomes a bar. And then we put a box around those three bars, and there's no reason for the box, it just kind of makes it easier to see what's going on. So if you have a box, and then a middle line in that box, that middle line is the median, the ends of the box, the quartiles. Now, the lines that extend out each side of the box, those are called the whiskers. And sometimes they end in a square thing, sometimes they don't. But where they end is either the minimum and maximum values, or if there are some outliers, some, some extreme values that aren't really like the rest, then, then the line ends before the extreme values, and then the extreme values get put in as dots. So this is a box plot for that data set. You can see that the lowest value is below 50 inches, <coughs> and the highest is nearly 75. 
So a box plot gives you a really good idea, or box and whiskers plot, gives you a really good idea of the distribution of a data set. You can see if it's symmetrical. You can see, you can kind of get a rough idea of whether it's relatively normal, not a great idea, but you can see the median and you can see the quartiles. So the five number summary is the minimum the, and, and the maximum and the three quartiles. And, and those are represented generally in a box plot with those five lines and then a box drawn around the, the middle three. So those are some outliers, according to the statistical program I use to do this. Those are called outliers. There's algorithms to determine what's an outlier and what's not. You can tweak it in any software. So the median is great because it has certain advantages. It works well with ordinal data. You can get a median of purely ordinal data. It's also often more typical than other measures. Um, in data sets that are, off, that are skewed, we will frequently use a median to describe the middle instead of using a mean. And it's not affected by a few extreme scores. Think about it. If 50% of the data are already above a score of, you know, what do we have here, 60 some odd inches, and then you realize, oh, that person who I measured is 73 inches, he actually had 78 inches was his height. The median didn't change. There's still the same number of scores above that median point as at that middle point is below it. So the median is resistant to change from a few extreme scores. So we call it robust because it's resistant to being jerked around by a few extreme observations. It has disadvantages though. You can't use it for unordered categorical data. The only thing you can use for a center for um, nominal or pure categorical data is the mode. But that's kind of the mode's problem, not the median's problem. And it is not representative of the value of every score, and that makes it less desirable as something we might use to um, for further calculation. So the mean has one big disadvantage. It can be influenced seriously by extreme observations, either very high or very low observations that are not typical of the rest of your data set will be pulled in the direction, or will pull the mean in their direction. So if you say, oh, I re just realized that guy who was 75 inches is actually 78 inches, well, the mean will shift now. But it's, So it's not great for skewed distributions because it will be non-representative. So here's, um, I don't remember what you call this, a dotted line plot. Anyway, it's, I doubt it was pretty. It's a histogram, essentially, but the dots help you see a few things here that would be a little harder to see with a histogram. Imagine those are bars instead of dots and lines. It's the same thing. You've got the categories down here at the bottom. So here's a U.S. Di income distribution from the 2010 census. Um, that's a skewed distribution. Now, like some graphs, it should keep going out for about two miles to the right because there are some people in these last two categories, 200 to 250,000 and 250,000 and over. There are there are a lot of those people and they're just spread out really, really far to the right. Some of them make $10 million, right? So that's going to be, seriously, this chart would have to be like like 50 feet long or something if you kept having regular intervals. So sometimes people just put one last lump at the end there. So the median is $50,000 more or less, just a little lower than 50000 but the mean is 67. Now think about that. That makes a big difference. Do you make 50,000 or do you make $67,000? This was thrown around quite a lot in the last election when um, people claimed that the average income in the U.S. was like 100,000, et cetera, and they were using some really odd data sets, and then they were using the mean instead of the median. But anybody who studies income would not use a mean to represent income because the mean is going to be dragged in the direction of those... Uh, increasingly few very wealthy people because that's what happens. Means are influenced by extreme scores because they're sensitive to every value in the data set. So with uh, seriously skewed data like this, you probably want to use a median instead of a mean because it will give you a much better idea of this, uh, of how things are distributed. So I think we're done with uh, this portion of analyzing numerical data, at least for right now.